associate professor at Stanford. And of course, she was at Berkeley before joining Stanford. And her research has won several awards, including the NSF Career Award, the Young Investiga Investigator Award, and also an Early Career Award. So Doris, we're super excited to hear from you and what your lab is up to. And for everyone who I would suggest and recommend if you can search on your video, that would be great. It's always good to see more faces. With that, Dorsa, you know, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, everyone, I will not be able to monitor chat because I have like one screen here. But if you have any questions, um, just to speak up, just, yeah, just interrupt me. I have a bunch of slides. I don't need to go through everything. So feel free to like stop me at any point and we can just chat about it. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Dorsa and in general, I work in this area of human robot interaction. And um, kind of my, my definition of human robot interaction is a little bit larger than I think most people's definition of human robot interaction. I'm very interested in thinking about how we can do better robot learning by using interactions. And I'm also very interested in developing and creating better interactions using ideas around learning. So, so that's why the name of the, the, this talk is kind of like walking this boundary of learning and interaction. What can learning do for, for better interactions and what can interactions and interaction data do for better robot learning? Um, so if you think about kind of the field of robotics, the field of robotics over the past like two decades, right? It has seen quite a bit of advances. And, and I'm sure you guys have seen some of these videos, right? The video on the left is from Boston Dynamics and this robot is doing parkour. And the robot on the right is basically having this block and moving this block from one configuration to another configuration. And one could say a lot of these advances, and we've seen a lot of other advances, I just want to put two things from industry here. Um, but, but one could say like a lot of these advances is due to having really good controllers, like the robot on the left, or it could be also due to having better machine learning running on robots, better robot learning, right? Like the robot on the right, the open AI arm is, is using a lot of ideas from reinforcement learning here. And that's very exciting, right? Like that is basically telling us that you're finally at a stage where we can think about long-term and intricate interactions between robots and humans, right? Finally, robotics is getting to a stage that we can think about how we can put these robots in our everyday lives and how they can interact with people, like autonomous cars interacting with people, or like thinking about uh, interaction at homes or having service robots, or even assistive robotics. Like that's something that I've got really excited about. There, there are a lot of interesting and intricate interactions between a person teleoperating an assistive arm. It, it's actually not that easy to teleoperate an assistive arm. So um, lots of interesting questions around interaction. And that kind of brings us to this question of like, how can we study interactions a little bit better, right? Like, how do we think about interactions between robots or AI agents and, and, and humans? And, and for that one paradigm to think about it is to, to consider how two humans interact with each other, right? Like if you have two humans, they can easily come to each other's spaces, they can collaborate and coordinate with each other. And then one way of studying this interaction is, is to think about, okay, like how is it that two humans are so good at this, so good at coordinating with each other? And, and this has been studied for, for many years. Uh, and one particular paradigm for that is to say, well, if these two humans are trying to do a task together, let's say play a game of chess, well, one way of modeling their interaction is to say that each one of these agents is going to have some sort of model, some sort of representation of the other agent and the other agent's policy, right? So, so, so you're going to think about how the other agent is going to act in this world and respond based on that. We can even go further and we can say, well, this other agent is going to think about our actions and the fact that we are thinking about them thinking about us and, and, and think about this game theoretic type of interaction between the agents and take this game theoretic interaction, like game theoretic type of model to, to, to model the interaction between the agents. Okay. 
So this is fairly familiar, right? Like this game theoretic modeling shows up in like a variety of fields, right? It shows up in game theory, like we were thinking about finding an equilibria here. It shows up, it shows up in natural language processing. The first time I, I saw that, I was like, oh, you guys have this too. So in natural language processing, this idea of rational speech act or like pragmatics, it's basically the same thing, right? Like, like we think about how the speaker or listener are coordinating with each other based on this game theoretic type of, type of idea. It shows up in multi-agent reinforcement learning, right? We call this opponent modeling. And, and in all of these different fields, right, um, we know that this is difficult to solve. This, this game is, is, has like this infinite regress, so it, it's actually pretty difficult to do this recursive belief modeling. So, so to avoid that, what do we do? Well, we cut the game at some time step, and then we have kind of like an, an nth order version of the game. So instead of having like the full game, like we solve this game like at the nth time step, and then we do an nth order uh, version of the game. And then this is often called theory of mind in human robot interaction. So we solve this as an nth order theory of mind. Okay. So, so that's perfectly fine. That's a very good way of doing things. That's a very common way of thinking about human robot interaction, solving it as an nth order theory of mind. The fact that the human has a model of the robot and the robot also has some sort of model of the human. And there's quite a bit of research here, right? Like the robot modeling the human, right? There is, this is, this is like the whole field of imitation learning kind of describes like how a robot tries to model what a human wants or what a human's preferences or reward functions are. And then the human building a model of the robot, this also goes back to quite a bit of work around it, like the re research in HRA, like trying to think about trust or trying to think about how a human would model robots actions or work around legibility. So, so lots of work in human robot interaction kind of falls into this paradigm of, of theory of mind. And, and actually, like our own work uh, a while back was basically trying to do the same thing in the space of autonomous driving. So this was around like 2016. And what we were looking at was we were looking at how an autonomous car, a fully autonomous car, interacts with a human driven car and how we model that interaction. So, so the way we modeled that interaction was basically using this, this game theoretic approach and then using this theory of mind modeling. So, so more specifically, what we did in this work was, well, we said we have an autonomous car, that, that's the orange car here. And we said, well, we want to plan for the actions of the autonomous car. That's the policy of the autonomous car. What would that be? That is going to be an optimizer of some sort of reward function. And often we say, well, that reward function should be a function of state and actions. That's usual. But, but our idea here was we need to think about the whole system with the human in it as a full dynamical system, as a full like system that where we where we consider this game theoretic interactions. So because of that, we say the reward function of the robot or like the objective of the robot depends on the actions of the human or influences the actions of the human. And then a very good question to ask is, well, how is it like, well, how do we model human? Right? What do humans do? And the way we model the human in this case is we model the human as an agent who is approximately optimizing their own reward function, RH. So this was kind of like the modeling that, that we had at the time. There are a lot of interesting research questions just on this one slide that I don't think are still like fully solved. Uh, like this question of what do humans do? What's the policy of the human? How do we do behavior modeling of humans? It's, it's like a very interesting question. There's quite a bit of research around it. The way we modeled humans in this work was by using just inverse reinforcement learning, we use maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning based on collected data of human driving. And based on that, we've learned a reward function uh, of how a human drives. Um, another good question to ask is, well, how do we make sure that that is right? Like when it comes to near accident scenarios or more challenging scenarios, we have, we have kind of like a thread of work on that that I'm not talking about today. I'm thinking about how humans drive in near accident scenarios. How, do, how does this model change, like this model of the human? And then there's quite a bit of interesting questions around like the robot or the autonomous car. What should be the reward function of the autonomous car? How do we like balance efficiency and safety and comfort and all the things that we care about? And this kind of like opens up a whole set of questions around reward design, right? Like how do we do reward design for our robots or autonomous cars? Um, and that's also a very difficult question. But we kind of like had some, some set of parameters and some set of, some set of uh, selections here. And, and the question that we wanted to answer here was, 
the interaction question. Okay, so like I pick a reward function for the robot, I do some sort of learning for the human. Once I have that, how do I go about modeling the interaction? And, and for that, we end up with this nested optimization. And of course, we had to approximate this, right? Like as I was saying earlier, solving the full theory of mind is really difficult. And we approximated this and, and we kind of cut the game at the first time step. We solved it as a stack over a game as, as opposed to a full game. And that was an okay approximation in this, in this case of driving because we were solving this in a model predictive control loop and, and it wasn't hurting us like because we were pre-planning at every time step. So, so this type of game theoretic modeling was kind of like working okay in this setting. And what was the outcome of that? The outcome of that was being able to do more interactive, more assertive type of maneuvers. The outcome of the, this interactive modeling was that we ended up having autonomous cars that could kind of like nudge in in front of other cars and, and make them slow down and change lanes. As opposed to kind of like driving in a way where, where you think about other drivers around you are moving obstacles and basically trying to, trying to avoid um, hitting them or colliding with them. We ended up getting this more interactive behavior where the car nudges. And then this is, yeah, as opposed to, let's say, like a behavior of this, this Waymo car, uh, where like the car, this, this, this is a kind of somewhat of an old video by this point, but the Waymo car, basically car wants to change lanes. It's in an exit lane. It is signaling, but it's basically thinking about the autonomous car kind of like in a silo as opposed to, as opposed to like thinking about interactions. And because of that, it's not able to change lanes. It needs to exit and come back around. So, so the whole point, right, like of, of this type of modeling that, that I've been arguing here is that in, in general, as we are building our autonomous system, as we are building our robots, we shouldn't think, we shouldn't think about them in isolation. And I think that is one mistake, a mistake that we often make, right? Like we think about building an autonomous car that's really good at driving and all of, all of its functionalities. But the moment you put that in a world, right? Like it's interacting with other agents and that interaction could actually affect its functionalities that could actually affect how it drives and so on. So, okay, so I've been basically talking about this theory of mind type of modeling and the fact that that is somewhat useful and, and people have been using it for a while. But in this talk, actually, I don't want to focus on theory of mind modeling as much. In this talk, I would like to talk about an orthogonal perspective to this theory of mind modeling. And, and the reason for that is I think there are a lot of tasks that actually don't fall into this category of theory of, theory of mind modeling. Like a lot of interactive tasks actually have nothing to do with playing chess. So here is an example. So imagine that you have two people, Alex and Bob here, like coming together, trying to build some sort of structure together. Okay. And again, humans are amazing at this. They come easily like in each other's spaces, they collaborate with each other. And how is it that Alex and Bob are able to do this? I, I really don't think Alex here is thinking, well, I wonder what Bob's beliefs over what my policies or my environment is. And then let me, let me think about that, that recursive belief modeling and, and let me think about the game tree and then go down the game tree. I, I really don't think that is what's happening here when we have these two people coordinating with each other. So, so I think what is happening here is that people are really good at figuring out what is the right, what is the right representation to keep track of and, 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 and keep track of that, that small low dimensional representation um, that is enough for, for achieving this task together. So, so people are very good at figuring out kind of like um, the, the right cues, the, the, the right like elements to, that, that can help you coordinate on this task. And we often have names for these things, right? Like we might call it roles, like who's leading or who's following, or we might call it intent, right? Like, who, like or goals, or like, like we often have, or styles, right? We often have like names for these low dimensional representations. And, and you might say, well, what is the big deal, right? Like people have done belief modeling over intents that, that like people have like palm DPs that can represent like uh, hidden states over intents and, and you have like a few intents and, and you can then solve it. What, what's the point, right? There has, there has been this type of modeling before. But the thing I'd like to argue is that I'm not trying to do belief modeling over five intents. That's not what my goal is. I'm trying to figure out what's the space of intents. I'm trying to figure out what is the space of representations that we need to keep track of in order to achieve an interactive task. 
And again, I think humans are really good at it, right? They don't come in saying, oh, there are five in 10, so let me do belief modeling over that. They immediately figure out what is the sufficient statistics of the task that they need to keep track of. So now that I've kind of like motivated this, let me kind of like get into the meat of the talk. I'm basically in this talk, what I'd like to focus on is, is this, this, this kind of orthogonal perspective to theory of mind modeling and trying to learn, directly learn a low dimensional representation that captures this interaction. And once we have this low dimensional representation, then we can think about evolutions of that, of that representation over time. And that can help us better adapt to, to new agents, like better collaborate and adapt and change over time. And, and in this talk, what I'd like to do is I'd like to first jump into this idea of learning these latent representations. And then once we have learned that, how can we use it and how can we leverage it for coordination and even going beyond coordination and, and thinking about influencing, right? Like the, the car example that I was giving earlier, it's kind of a very interesting type of coordination. Sure, the, the agents are coordinating with each other, but they're doing something beyond coordination. And what that what and what that is 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 that this this white car by nudging it in front of this other driver, it's also influencing this other driver, right? Like this this, this black car is like if it was going like. I don't know, 20 miles per hour, if, if this car cuts in front of it, it's not going to go 20 miles per hour anymore. It's actually going to go 10 miles per hour because a car cut in front of it. So, so this idea of influencing is pretty interesting. The fact that when you put an autonomous system, a robot in people's worlds, like that, that, that robot can influence other agents and make other agents change their behaviors is pretty interesting. And this orthogonal perspective that I've been talking about, I'd, I'd like to be able to use that representation to influence interactions, okay? All right, so I've been motivating this idea of interaction and, and modeling that interaction using representations. And, and as I was just saying, when you put other agents, robots, humans in, in people's worlds, that can kind of create this non-stationarity in this world. And then these agents can update their behavior in response to the robot or, or this other agent, the collaborator that is there. And then we need to really capture that. Without capturing that, you're not gonna get very interactive behaviors. So we started looking at this problem in kind of like a simple air hockey example. So, so imagine, actually it wasn't that simple. I'm not gonna call it simple. This was very difficult to get working, but kind of like from surface, it, it is simple. Um, so, so in this case, uh, we have two agents. We have um, an ego agent and an other agent. Ego agent is a robot on the left. This is our learning agent. This is the agent that we're trying to like decide on what it should be doing. And then the other agent is just another agent. Um, the reason I'm calling it other agent is this paradigm works for both competitive or collaborative settings. So I don't want to call it an opponent or partner because it could just be the other agent. Um, and, and this other agent in this case is a rule-based agent. And what that means is it has some policy and the policy basically tells the, the, the other agent to push the puck to the left or center or to the right. Okay, so this is kind of like at the high level what it does, but at the end of the day, like the robot is following, like having a set of joints and, 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 and based on that, it is basically pushing the puck toward any of these directions. So then a trajectory from the perspective of the ego agent is a trajectory of, of a set of states and, and the ego agent's actions and the rewards that the ego agent gets. Okay, And the reward is based on if, the fact that if it blocks the puck, it gets some reward. And if it doesn't, right, there is some distance between the, 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 the robot and the puck, and that kind of defines the reward. Okay, and, and this other agent, this other agent follows some sort of strategy. And that strategy is also based on the past trajectory. And, and that strategy in this case is kind of simple. What it does is it pushes the puck and if the ego agent blocks it, it is going to push it toward a different direction, okay? So, so that is basically the strategy of the other agent. And in this scenario, we don't have access to this function. Like we don't know what, what this other agent is doing. We're just like observing it, but we have no idea what is the policy of the other agent. And I'm kind of like representing this other agent using these Zs that kind of like are corresponding to the directions that I was talking about. But at the end of the day, like this other agent has some sort of policy and I don't really have access to these Zs. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to coordinate with this agent and what I'm suggesting is, as opposed to me doing theory of mind modeling and trying to kind of represent everything about the policy of this agent and 
then try to do belief modeling over that. What I'm suggesting is we should try to just directly figure out what is the low dimensional representation that we need to keep track of for us to better coordinate with this other agent. Okay, so, so what we're looking at is we're looking at kind of like a sequence, a trajectory, an episode, and this, this tau represents that. And we're trying to encode that, that observation that, that we just had into a low dimensional representation, ZK. And then the way we are learning the ZK is, is, is basically by, by looking at a prediction loss, by, by trying to uh, train an encoder and decoder, kind of like an autoencoder, but, but the loss is a prediction loss predicting the next episode, the next sequence. And the ZK is really a Z hat K. It's, it's an estimate of the Z that I was showing earlier. It's an estimate of the Z. It's not the true Z, but we're basically trying to figure out what is an estimate of that by, by basically an autoencoder using, using some sort of prediction loss. Okay. And, and this ZK, like ideally we've created this so then ZK has some meaning too, right? It doesn't have to have meaning, but we've created this, this, this um, example in a way that we expect ZK to correspond to that directionality. Like, are you pushing the puck to the left or right or center? Right? I never said like, hey, you should, you should have these three buckets and go and learn those three buckets. I'm basically trying to directly figure out what I need to keep track of. And ideally in this case, it should be that directionality of where, where the puck is being pushed. All right, so, so, so that kind of represents my uh, low dimensional representation, my, my ZK, my, my model of the other agent, my low dimensional representation of the other agent. And, and once I have that, what I can do is I can do my usual like reinforcement learning, right? Like what I can do is from the perspective of the ego agent, from the perspective of my robot, what I can do is I can try to maximize an expected return, right? Expected sum of returns, subject to the fact that I have a policy and that policy is now conditioned on, on my knowledge of what the other agent is doing. Where does that knowledge come from? That knowledge comes from this representation learning component. Okay. And then we are calling this framework learning and influencing latent intent or Lily. And we are like training this representation learning and reinforcement learning kind of at the same time, right? Like we are learning a representation that is fed to reinforcement learning. And the next time step, we take a step. And then based on that, we get a new sequence. And then based on that, we, we learn new representation. And, and by doing so, by maximizing this expected return, then we are able to react to the other agent. We are able to coordinate with the other agent. Actually, any questions so far? All right, if there are any questions, feel free to just jump in. Okay, so let's see what this reacting idea works or how that works. So going back to this air hockey example, right? So if the other agent pushes the puck and if the ego agent blocks the puck, then we are gonna say, well, the ego agent is going to get a reward of plus one. And we are kind of artificially making this example. So if the, if the ego agent blocks the puck on the left, it is going to get more reward. It's going to get a reward of plus two. So I'm artificially making it. So maybe ego agent prefers, really prefers to go to the left. So if it, if it is going to the left to block the puck, then, then it's going to get a higher reward, okay? So if I'm training, let's say soft actor critic, then soft actor critic after like two hours of training, what it learns is it learns to in general how to block a puck and, and, and it kind of doesn't have a model of the other agent. So, so the, what it learns is it learns to always go to one side, right? In this case, for example, after two hours of training, it learns to always go to the right. And sometimes it gets lucky and it's able to block the puck. Sometimes it doesn't because again, it doesn't model the other agent. So it's not able to learn like where the puck is being pushed. But in general, if it goes to the right, some number of times it's able to block the puck. And then finally, after four hours of training, what it learns is it learns to still like go to only one side, but now it goes to the left because it realizes that you get you get higher reward if you if you go to the left. Okay. So so if you look at kind of like the success plot here, what we see is uh, we see that um, it kind of like the soft actor critic agent it always blocks on the right and it gets some number of success. And at some point it realizes, oh, I should go to the left because that gives me higher reward and kind of stays there. And then the success rate is around like 40%. So 40% of the times 
it, it is able to block the block. Okay. So if you're using our algorithm, Lily, what ends up happening is after four hours of training, then Lily is able to basically block the puck no matter where the agent pushes it because it's kind of like models. Again, it models the policy, the policy of the other agent and the transitions of that Z. And because of that, it's kind of like able to predict what is going to happen next. And uh, sorry, based on that, uh, it's basically able to have a much higher success. So the success rate is around 90%. Okay. So is there an intuition dot so why in like SAC, I mean, could model a multimodal distribution, but it doesn't end up modeling one. Yes. Yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. so is that because the state of the other agent is not a part of the state of SAC or is it you know, because it's not predicting what the other agent is going to be doing. Yeah, so it is actually so. So, so you might say, okay, it, it, the state of the other agent, the, the state is given, but the actions of the other agent is not part of the uh, what what SAC sees. And you might say, okay, if I train like longer, and if I give that action, right, like SAC should be able to like capture the other agent, and and that is true, right? Like that that argument that. Well, everything is data eventually, right? Like if I have like a large enough model and train it long enough, then it should be able, as part of its model, it should be able to have some sort of representation of what the other agent is doing. And in this case, it doesn't have that because it doesn't really like, like have access to actions of the other agent and it doesn't model the actions of the other agent. So, so here, like the idea of Lily is how can we more scalably and effectively like model uh, the other agent and model like the right representation that is needed of the other agent and then use that for coordination. Uh, but yeah, one could say if I have access to all of these data and just give it like a long enough time, then SAC should be able to learn it too. So, so just on the point of knowledge of the action, right? So suppose if I observe the states of the other agent, so if I just observe a few states, I might know if it is going to push towards left or right. But I mean, as you're saying, that much that might require a lot more data mm -hmm. to infer from the states whether I'm going left or right. And that is exactly where I guess Lily comes in and says, well, you know, we can make that process be much more efficient and scalable. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that is exactly right. Yeah. So so Lily is right. What is the right representation that I need to look at instead of me worrying about like all of the data and instead of me worrying about like what is the progression of all of that data too? Because it's not just like, like the other thing that I want to emphasize here is the fact that Z is not a fixed Z, right? Like there, it does have a dynamics. So, so you also need to learn the dynamics of Z, the fact that it's not always like pushing to the right or not always like pushing to the right or left. It has like some, there is some underlying policy for how Z is changing. And, and if, as long as we know what's the right representation of Z, we can kind of like have a representation of that F function and how that, that Z is, is actually changing. Um, and it's yeah more scalable by using Lily basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, Dorset. Yes. Um, I wonder how could you figure out the representation to learn when the human and the robot is doing something collaborative way, like making the table together or cooking mm -hmm. together. And what might be that might involve different object and and should achieve the goal together without it come, uh, maybe uh, when I do something I want you to not do something. Mm -hmm. How do you do with that? Yeah, so nothing about this is actually about competitive scenarios. I know I'm showing like a competitive scenario, but nothing about the approach I've said so far is saying, oh, this is a competitive game. And we actually have some collaborative like examples of this in in, in the paper. So. Here, like the way we are learning the representation is basically it's saying, hey, capture the only thing that is needed. This is, like, this is almost an approximation of the sufficient statistic that is needed for coordination. And that coordination could be competition, could be cooperation. So, so imagine two agents moving a table, right? Like if it is, like we have actually tried this, like if you have in simulation, like if you have like two agents trying to move a table together, that, that Z kind of captures like the leading following roles of, who is pushing the table in what direction. And you can still like use a very similar approach to capture like that leading and following role, um, which could be used for better coordination with the other, with the other agent, with the human or the other agent for let's say moving a table. So you mean you observe the data of the, my human pushing the table in one direction and my robot learning to push in the same direction? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so the setup that we have basically tried is yeah, you have two agents um, that are 
yeah, basically trying to push a table and there are some number of obstacles and the obstacles are not visible to each agent. So you might feel like pushes and pulls from the other agent and you still, you wanna basically avoid hitting obstacles based on those pushes and pulls. So, so kind of like the underlying, the underlying um, Z that, that is being captured, one could, one could call that a name and say, well, it's leading and following. Like you're capturing, like if, if the other agent is leading or following or like, like what direction generally, what direction it's pushing the table. And uh, yeah, we have actually like tried the same framework here and, and Z kind of like captures that leading and following element. Got it. That's cool. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I've been basically talking about this idea of learning representations and then using those representations for better reacting to other agents. But the thing I want to argue is um, that we can do better than this, right? Like, like this is this is fine, right? Like you're reacting to other agents, but you can actually go beyond reacting to other agents. You can influence other agents. Like, remember I was talking about the car cutting in front of another car and how that influences it to slow down. We can kind of get the same sort of behavior here by by instead of optimizing for expected return within an interaction we can maximize expected return across multiple interactions. And if we, if we maximize expected return across multiple interactions, that allows us to think about these more long-term behaviors that we care about. And by doing so, the ego agent can, can kind of like in, think ahead and, and influence the, the other agent to respond in specific ways. And, and what that translates to in this, in this particular air hockey example is, is remember in the air hockey example, like our ego agent was really good at going to the left, right? Ideally, our ego agent really prefers to just go to the left. That would be awesome if, if it is able to do that. And, and when we are using this idea of influencing, which means that instead of just looking at the expected return in, in an interaction, like consider consider like maximizing it across multiple interactions. If, if we do that, then our agent is able to get the other agent respond in specific ways that, that leads to going to the left more often. So in terms of success rate, like when we are using Lily with influencing, what ends up happening is in terms of success rate, it is very similar to Lily with no influencing, right? Like both of them are like around 90% of the times they're able to block the puck. That is pretty good. That's great. But what ends up happening is with influencing, we are able to kind of like get the other agent push the puck more often to the left because that is a thing that we really preferred. And then and, and we get like 40, 41% of the times the puck goes to the left as opposed to like 30%, like uniformly, the puck goes to the left, middle or right, which is the case that we get with no influencing, which is, which is kind of cool because again, like it's, it's kind of like manipulating the other agent, but maybe for some better objective or maybe for some long-term objective, um, it's, it's interesting to be able to do that. So, so just to summarize what I've been talking about so far, well, the key takeaways here is that human partners well, or other agents, they're often non-stationary. And what that means is when, they put, when you put them in people's worlds, like people are going to change how they act in response to the actions of the robot or, or in the actions of the other, in response to the actions of the other agent. And this can potentially be represented by, by a low dimensional latent strategy, like a low dimensional latent intent, as opposed to, let's say, doing theory of mind modeling and trying to worry about beliefs and, and, and recursive belief modeling. So, so I would say this is kind of like an orthogonal perspective to that view of modeling interactions. And, and the idea that I've been talking about is, is this algorithm, Lily, that anticipates these partner strategies by using latent strategies to, to react and to further influence other agents and, and, and coordinate with other agents. Okay. All right. So, so that's great learning and influencing interactions. But remember, like I was motivating this whole thing to work with actual humans. Like I, I was basically talking about like our motivation to do to use latent strategies because like, like I said, well, the way we do that is the, the way we do this, this type of interaction modeling is because humans are really good at. Uh, coordinating with each other, humans are really good at capturing low dimensional representations. And the whole goal was at the end of the day to coordinate with actual humans, right? Like pair up this robot with a human and, and actually play a game with a human. And, and it turns out that when we pair this up with 
an actual human, then success rate is going to go down a lot more. So, so we're going to get like around 73% of success when you're playing with a human expert. And we need to also like tell our human expert to play in specific ways. And, and there's a lot of like more noise and um, a lot of other factors that, that come in when we pair this up with humans. And, and the problem is like, I need to like train this system at the end of the day with a human in the loop. And remember like the training was taking four hours. So I can't really like pair up a person in a deep RL loop. And then that is really a big problem, right? Like, sure, like I've been talking about this idea of latent strategies, I would like it to work with humans, but learning with real humans in the loop is often very impractical and very challenging. So the thing I'd like to talk about next a little bit is this idea of how can we learn better from interaction data. So, so in the first part, right, like I've been talking about how we can do better interactions with robot learning. And the second part, I would like to think about how we can learn better when we have interaction data and how we can use our interaction data. Because on the surface, it seems completely impractical to bring in a person and like a deep RL loop. Like that, that just seems like impossible. But in general, there is still like quite a bit of data from humans. And I think we can be we can be smarter about how we collect our data from humans or what type of data we are collecting when, when we are thinking about learning from interactions. And, and kind of the two main takeaways here, let me just tell you the takeaways before jumping into it, is I think we can be smarter about the sources of data that we are, we are using and tapping into. Um, I think we often just rely on very specific clean sources of data and maybe we can we can be a little bit uh, smarter and broader when it comes to different sources of data. And then the second point is maybe we can be a little bit more careful about what data we are collecting and, and how we can actively query the right data that is needed from humans. So if you think about, so, so in, the, in this next section, and, and I'm gonna make sure to end by 9.30. Let me just make sure how much time do I have. Um, we'll get 9.30. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can go a few minutes over if you want to, but around that is a good time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll I'll try to just wrap it up at nine thirty. Yeah. So so yeah. In this next section, what I'd like to talk about is this idea of learning from human data, and and this idea of learning from human data has been around for a while, right? Like like this idea of learning from demonstrations and it has been around for like two decades at least in the, in the AI field, and and. Usually, like the common paradigm is that there is some expert demonstrations, and then we can go ahead and learn from expert demonstrations, right? Like we can do imitation learning from expert demonstrations. But this seems pretty limiting because expert demonstrations is very limiting when it comes to robots. And it's pretty difficult to also teleoperate these robots and collect expert demonstrations on them. But in general, there are many other sources of data and, and, and in our lab, we have been thinking about this problem for a while and we're trying to like tap into these different sources of data to better learn the, these models of what the human wants or reward functions or policies of how robots should act in the world based on human preferences. And specifically, one, a couple of directions, just briefly um, at the high level I'm going to talk about is we're looking at some optimal demonstrations as another source of data. Like if you look at teleoperation data or VR data, it's often not very clean, right? Like if you, if you, bring, if you try to crowdsource this, this data, it's often not very clean expert demonstrations. And then we're doing quite a bit of work in this, in this space, trying to think about settings where we do have some optimal data and, and how can we still learn from suboptimal data? How can, we, how can we have some sort of confidence measure on what part of demonstrations we should pay attention to and what parts of demonstrations we should, we should kind of ignore? We're also thinking about observations, like third-person observations. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in terms of learning from, let's say, videos, right? There, there, like, if you if you think about um, if you think about like why deep learning has made an effect in, in let's say, um, vision or in, in NLP, part of the reason is there is just tons of data out there for in, in, for language data or vision data, and we don't really have that in robotics. And an interesting question here is, of course, like, can we tap into um, data from videos? Uh, can we tap into, and can we tap into data from language and, and this multimodality of data, and from that, try to learn some sort of uh, model uh, or some sort of policy or reward function? 
function for the robot. So that's in general the direction that we have started doing some work around. Uh, specifically, we are also looking at language instructions and, and narrations and how we can learn from language instructions and narrations kind of in an interactive fashion as well. Like how can we do interactive teaching using language? In addition to these, um, over the past couple of years, we've also been looking at other sources of data, including pairwise comparisons and rankings. Um, this is an interesting source of data. Instead of asking a person to provide a full-on expert demonstration, what the robot does is it shows you a couple of demonstrations and then asks you to just rank them or, or do pairwise comparison. And, and it's an easy type of data to collect and it still has quite a bit of information in it. And then it, it's interesting to think about how we can tap into this type of data to better learn the word functions. And, and, and finally, more recently, we've been looking at learning from physical corrections. Like if you think about the robot, it does have an embodiment, you can actually move it around. So, so by moving it around, like could we could we learn from uh, from these physical corrections that humans provide to to again update our reward function? So I want to very briefly mention uh, some of our work around learning per, from pairwise comparisons and physical corrections today. Um, and specifically on the pairwise comparison side of things, the question that we are interested in is. How can we look for the most informative data? How can we how can we actively query people and actively get the most useful amount, like type of type of data that one could get instead of just blindly collecting lots of lots of data? So, so what I mean by pairwise comparisons is the robot can show you two different trajectories, A and B, and then ask you which one do you prefer. And based on that response of that simple response to binary question, you're going to get some sort of information about some underlying reward function here. And that underlying reward function could be parameterized. In this case, imagine it's parameterized by, by a set of parameter thetas. And imagine it's linear. It doesn't have to be linear. But, but basically, what that tells me is that Imagine theta lies in, in a three-dimensional space. And that tells me is every question, every query that I would ask a user could generate like a separating hyperplane in the space of my parameters, in the space of my theta parameters. So, so these theta, like imagine theta is in this three-dimensional space and it lies in a unit ball. So we can sample from this unit ball. And the true theta, the true parameters is maybe somewhere in this space, maybe this, this one. So every question that I would ask from a user can correspond to like some sort of hyperplane in this space. And the human's response to that question basically tells us which side of the hyperplane is, is preferred, right? Do you like the right side or left side of the hyperplane? And then that's basically, then, then based on that response, you're going to ignore the left side and you're going to reveal your samples. And then based on that, you're going to get closer to the true distribution of, of your parameter thetas. So then the interesting research question here is, what is the sequence of most informative, diverse set of questions and queries that I can ask my user in order to better learn this, this reward function or parameters of the reward function? And the simplest way one can model this problem is as an active learning problem. So, so the way we modeled this is by saying that, hey, we, can, we, can, we, we would like to generate scenarios. These Ps correspond to scenarios so that we are maximizing the minimum volume that would be removed from this hypothesis space. Okay, so, so remember uh, this figure, this is my hypothesis space. I would like to generate a scenario, a hyperplane, that corresponds to removing as much space as possible from, from, from the, 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 space of, the space of thetas, because I wanna quickly figure out what is the true theta, which is let's say this one. Okay, and, and that kind of corresponds to this active learning question. And then this is a volume removal objective, it's a submodular objective, and we have kind of a similar set of guarantees that one would have in submodular optimization. Um, and, and that kind of allows us to, to sequentially generate new interesting questions to ask a user and, and, and based on that, update our parameters. A couple of side notes on this. So one side note is humans are noisy. So of course, we're not gonna just directly listen to what they say. We use a human noise model using this idea of Boltzmann distribution based on how noisy humans are. And then based on that, we reweigh our samples. We don't completely remove the wrong side of the, the hyperplane. The second side note is there is a constraint here. The constraint is basically making sure the scenarios we are generating are realizable, like they actually can run on the system, they satisfy dynamics. So, so that's basically what the constraint would, says, would say. 
In addition to that, another side note is this objective of volume removal. It's an information theoretic objective, but there are other information theoretic objectives that would make sense to use here. So, so in some of the follow-up works, we have looked at other measures like using determinantal point processes, which is a measure of diversity. It's a formal measure of diversity. And, and one could use that instead of this objective. Or one could use entropy, and entropy is also another information theoretic objective. It's it's still submodular. You could you could use entropy as another term here, or some sort of information gain term to, to optimize as opposed to volume removal. And then we've played around with these different objectives, and some are better than others in various scenarios. One specific point I'd like to make is when you use something like information gain, you actually consider humans' uncertainty in responding to questions. And, and that is pretty interesting because if, if you use volume removal, you don't really care about how, like, how easy these questions are from a human's perspective. Right? You just ask the most informative thing from the robot's perspective because the robot wants to quickly figure out like, how it should do a task and quickly figure out what the theta parameters are. But you're bringing in a person in the loop and you should make sure that these questions are actually easy and intuitive to be answered by the human. So using a measure like information gain can actually capture that, can capture human uncertainty in the objective and how easy and intuitive the questions are from the perspective of the human. But basically I'm summarizing a bunch of works here, but the gist of it is one could do this idea of active learning and that allows us to kind of more quickly learn the reward functions. And here is kind of the simplest form of this in a very simple 2D simulator where we have a vehicle, we have this, this, this um, orange car and after zero questions, the car really doesn't know what to do. But after 30 questions, it learns how to keep heading. And then finally, after 70 questions, the car kind of learns how to drive in this simple simulator, right? Like it keeps heading and it kind of stays within the lane and does collision avoidance and things of those form, which is kind of nice because again, no expert demonstrations, none of that, right? This is 70 simple binary questions. And from that, we are able to basically learn how to drive in this simple simulator. A few other follow-ups that I want to very briefly mention is um, thinking about more complicated reward functions. So we, everything I've said so far assumes that this reward function is linear in a set of non-linear reward functions. And that's an okay assumption in many settings because like, like we often, a designer often knows what these features are. But there is also the problem of reward design, and sometimes that is pretty challenging to do. So um, what we have looked at recently is thinking about nonlinear reward functions. So, so uh, we have looked at a setting where we have a robot trying to play a version of mini golf, uh, basically trying to push this, this ball inside any of these targets. And the human teacher here, the human user here, is going to basically tell the robot or has some sort of preference for where the target should be. Maybe they want to they want to the ball to go to the pink target. And then the way the human is providing feedback is by providing feedback about um, trajectories that the robot generates. So similar to before, the robot is just going to generate a bunch of trajectories A and B, and then the human is basically providing feedback of if the trajectory is good or bad. The trajectories are not going to look this good, by the way. They're going to be all over the place at the beginning. But the idea is if I were to use a simple linear reward function, I wouldn't be able to achieve this goal unless I have very complicated features. So ideally, if I, if I, if I, have, um, if I have very simple features like shot speed or shot angle, I would like to still be able to do this task. And, and using a linear reward, I, I never would be able to do this because a linear reward, if you use a linear reward and you maximize any reward function in these features, you'd end up, you'd end up always targeting kind of like the corners here because you, uh, you'd end up always picking the max of some sort of shot speed and shot angle. And that always like gets you to the corners. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to more expressive using a nonlinear reward function. And specifically, we decided to use Gaussian processes here to be able to capture like any of these targets and then try to get the robot pushed for any of these targets. So by doing so, I'm, I'm skipping the math here. There, there is a quite a bit of 
approximations that need to happen here. Um, and then the reason for that is here, like the task we're doing is we're doing active learning over Gaussian processes. So, so we query a user, and then based on that query update, like A or B better, then we need to update this Gaussian process, and the posterior turns out to, to not be a Gaussian process anymore. So we need to use Laplace approximation to actually like make that happen and, and keep the posterior uh, in the same distribution as, as the prior. And, 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 and by doing so, we are, we are basically approximating this Gaussian process based on this active querying of the user. All right, so, so just looking at how that works in practice, if we use this linear reward, as I was saying earlier, if you optimize a linear reward in these simple features, it's always going to push the, push the, um, the ball to the, to the sides. But using a GP reward and using this active querying approach, then we are able to push the, push the ball into any of these other targets, uh, any of the preferred targets of the user, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, and some other nonlinear reward version of this that we have been looking at is uh, to actually use these uh, ideas of active learning with uh, exoskeletons. So uh, we are looking at human preferences uh, for their gate, their walking gates, basically. And then this is a very interesting question because, um, like, we need to actually be safe when we are querying people, and 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 we need to, um, we need, we need, like, the. the queries that you're making need to be comfortable and safe from the person's perspective. So that kind of creates um, some sort of safety measure that, that one needs to consider when we are generating, actively generating these queries based on our uncertainty measures. Uh, so this is work with folks at Caltech um, and, and we actually like tried this out under system um, and did active learning over people's gate preferences. Um, this work is actually going to be presented at ICRA soon. All right, so, so just to summarize what I've been talking about in, 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 this, in this section is this idea of active learning, active learning of human preferences based on pairwise comparisons. And the point of that is instead of just relying on lots of lots of lots of data, let's just be careful about what data you're collecting from people because it, like that data is really precious. So, so we need to be careful about what data we are asking for. And, and one can do that by actively synthesizing new, new scenarios on the robot and querying people based on that. Um, and, and we've used a variety of different types of loss functions here, volume removal, information gain, determinantal point processes. And then we've kind of tried that in settings using linear reward functions and nonlinear reward functions for, for learning human preferences um, in, in a variety of settings. So, so the last point that I, um, I'm gonna skip this, uh, this was a very side note idea that you're using active learning for human AI interaction in negotiations. So I'm not gonna talk about this due to time. But yeah, so, so another direction that I think is interesting is kind of the second point I was gonna make in this idea of learning from human data. The first point is, hey, we need to do active learning. We need to look for the right data. The second point is we need to just tap into different types of data sources that are out there. And physical corrections is one of them, right? Like if you look at, if you look, you look at a person moving your robot arm, uh, there's quite a bit of information in that. And by these pushes and pulls on the robot arm, the robot needs to figure out how to project the, the, the rest of the trajectory and how to update its knowledge of human preferences. And then that's something that we've recently been looking at. We have, we have been thinking about how humans can learn, um, sorry, how humans can teach uh, based on multiple correlated interactions with a robot. So, so the idea is instead of having like one push on the robot, maybe we have a sequence of pushes on the robot and those sequences are interdependent sequence of corrections. And how can the robot use this interdependent sequence of corrections to better learn how to do a task? The specific example we're looking at here is, is an example where we have two arms holding a grocery bag that has stuff in it. And then basically the, the robots are trying to help you unpack the grocery bag and they're putting the grocery bag somewhere on the table. They don't know that you have a preference for the grocery bag to go to the green region. Maybe there is like water like on the cabinet or something. Maybe, maybe there's water here and you really don't want the robot to put the bag on the water. And, and because of that, maybe, maybe you want the robot to, to push the bag somewhere in the green region. And, and the way like we, we do that is uh, basically by providing a sequence of correction. So, so at the beginning, this is the trajectory that the robot is going for. And the idea is the human put comes comes in. Oh, sorry, I should have played that that video. So, so the idea is the human comes in 
and provides a bunch of pushes and pulls um, on the robot. And the robot needs to know how to propagate the rest of the trajectory based on those pushes and pulls. Just based on that one single push, the robot needs to update its trajectory. And then based on the second push, the robot needs to use that built on top of the first push and, and, and learn what the human's preferences are and, and, and learn like what is the underlying reward function. We're doing that time. So super quickly, um, we basically, uh, I don't know if I have time for it, but basically um, what we do is uh, we try to estimate this uh, the probability of the parameters of the reward function, the same theta as based on the sequence of queries. And the way we look at the sequence of queries, probability of sequence of queries is by assuming there is again, some underlying objective for the person that captures their efforts that they're putting in and their actual preference of where the robot should, should put the object and how they built on top of each other. I think the, the, the core point here that I want to make is that these sequence of corrections built on top of each other are not independent. And, and how do we capture this interdependency is the thing that actually matters. All right, so let me just wrap up. Um, so what have I been talking about? I've been talking about using robot learning for better interaction. And then specifically what I've been talking about is learning the right representations that matter. So literally what it does is learns the right representation and uses that for better coordination and also influencing. And the second part, I've been talking about the fact that we can be smarter about learning from interaction data, learning from human data. And then we've been using that for, for learning reward functions in a variety of scenarios. And some direction that we have been thinking about going forward is, is thinking about long-term repeated interaction. So everything I've said so far has been trying to consider interactions a little bit more carefully. Like we don't think about robots in isolation anymore. We think about them in, in this loop of interaction, but still a lot of these interactions are one step or few step interactions. And I think an interesting question to ask is what happens when you consider long-term repeated interactions? And, and, and for that, um, we have been thinking about this idea of agents trying to play various types of games together over long-term periods of interactions. Like the idea is, if you look at this player, this, this player is setting the ball for one of these two other players, player 14 or player 16. And by just looking at it, I have no idea which player, like who, who the ball was set for. But, but these players, like they know exactly who the ball was set for. And the reason for that is they have lots and lots of experience of playing together. And that comes from repeated long-term interactions. That's not like a single or few step interaction. And we're basically trying to capture the same thing. So, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to play these types of games, like putting blocks together. And then we're looking at agents coordinating and collaborating with each other on that over long-term period, periods and how agents like build conventions with each other. How, again, there is, I'd argue that there's a low dimensional representation here that captures like the interaction and signaling, but this time over long-term periods of interaction. And then this is a work that we've been looking at um, in an iCLR work where we take a modular approach, um, getting the agents coordinate with each other on a variety of games, like game of Hanabi or block stacking and, and things of those form. And again, using the same idea of picking the right representation for collaborating and coordinating with each other. So um, yeah, so, and just the last slide, the reason I think this is important is you're seeing more and more of these robots on our, in our folds and it's not a single interaction anymore, right? Like, like Waymo is putting out a fleet of cars on roads. And I think it would be interesting to think about how these fleet of cars, for example, can affect things like congestion or long-term behaviors on, on, on roads or societal objectives that one would want to consider. And for that, we really need to think about conventions that people build and how these type of representations emerge and change over time. So um, yeah, with that, I'd like to thank the group during the COVID time. And I can take any questions if there's any time, but I think I'm over. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Dorsa. Let's thank Dorsa for the wonderful talk. I can stop here. And now we can take any quick questions anyone might have. Uh, I have a quick question, actually. Uh, so the last part, uh, like, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so the last part is super interesting. I mean, but a great talk. 
Um, the last part was like super interesting in the sense that like I was thinking about like we actually have like one agent uh, having its a decision depending on the other agent and necessarily introduces like latency, right? It's like uh, pulling the two arms of the same like uh, bag. Um, I wonder like, uh, like, uh, like uh, what your thoughts are uh, on like how convention helps reduce that latency, especially in like a sports where like the, the, the dynamics so fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like I kind of like went very quickly for the last part, but um, I think this idea of repeated interactions, right? Like from that, you can kind of like, again, figure out what is like, what is a representation of a convention that you build and look for that. So the approach that we took in this last work that I didn't cover is a modular perspective where we kind of like separate that, separate what is the part about the partner, like what are convention, like partner specific conventions. And then what are, what are the parts of what are the actions that you do that are about the task? So what are kind of like rule dependent type of type of type, type of um, actions that, that, that you take? And by taking this modular approach, like we train this in a modular way, by taking this modular approach, we can quickly adapt to new partners or we can quickly adapt to new tasks by, by being able to like separate out what is it that's about the partner and what is it that's about the, the kind of the task and just keeping track of that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Cool. Any any more questions? I think we have time for one more. No. Okay. Well, then I guess people might ask you a lot of questions. Don't send your one on ones. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for having yeah. me again.